All right, good afternoon to our participants coming from Egypt and good morning to those joining from the eastern part of the United States. Uh, thanks very much for coming. This will be the last of our COVID workshops and today we wanted to talk about processes for beginning to open up our campuses and doing so safely. And we're very fortunate today to have Professor Pierre Lemerceau. He is a professor in mechanical engineering and a very prominent researcher in engineering computation. And he also serves as our associate department head for research and operations. And he's been leading us through the process of ramping back up and all the uh, logistics that are involved there. So without further delays, let me please uh, hand over the control of the screen and the microphones to Pierre. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dan. So it's uh, my pleasure to uh, make a presentation uh, today. Right, as I was uh, mentioning to Dan, Dina and Robert uh, before, right, uh, a, like the presentation here is not to provide you with suggestions of what you should do, but more as a discussion, right, and telling you what we have done, and that doesn't mean that you should do the same, right? Uh, so every country, every culture is different, and we need to adapt to the local consideration and basically, and that even within our department in mechanical engineering, there's 72 or so faculty. Everyone is very different. How they do research is almost a different world. And, and uh, you know, when you start walking around in, in offices and research labs, things are very different. And so basically respecting the local differences is, is very important. And sometimes, you know, when you work at the level of countries, people tend to forget that and then tell other countries how they should do their, their work. That's not really what, what uh, I, I want to do, right? I just want to tell you what we have done, and then there may be things that you can utilize for, for Egypt. There may be other things that don't apply at all. And so if at times it sounds like I'm telling you that's what we did, you should do the same, that's not really the intent. You, you should adapt to the local uh, conditions, right? And I trust that, that you can do that. So... With that, uh, I'll start. So the presentation is going to be some slides and then I will show you uh, some um, uh, information from the website. Don't hesitate to ask questions along the way, right? As I said, it's better to, to have it and it doesn't look like we're too many, uh, you know, 300 people. So you can also interrupt at any moment. Uh, I'm just a normal person and uh, Dan will also control the chat, but I think it is okay if you interrupt if you have questions. All right, so I'll talk about the MIT and the mechanical engineering research ramp up. Uh, and Dan already said uh, who, I, who I was. So originally I'm from Belgium. I guess uh, that's where the French accent comes from. And so we started, right? Uh, really, we were ready for the ramp up uh, around May 1st, like when Mickey, we're a little bit ahead. Uh, uh, of maybe MIT as a whole. And I was, I wanted to make sure that, you know, we had, to, had enough discussion to try to have a, a fair, safe and effective uh, research ramp up with the faculty and also uh, the researchers and the uh, staff, right? So we started our planning in April, which was maybe a little bit early since, you know, the, we closed down MIT around April, 5th, uh, March 15 also. And so we had several faculty lunches and we had the final plan, right, uh, uh, that we issued was on May 1st. And then further guidance came from MIT, right, but we wanted to have a head discussion so that we would gather inputs from, from everyone. Obviously, the, the main thing is you want to follow the health and the safety guidelines, right, to minimize risks. And so that means, you know, frequent testing, uh, protective equipment, you know, masks, gloves, etc. So uh, everybody is required to wear a face coverings uh, in Cambridge at, at the moment. Uh, and in, at MIT, that's required. You no know, social distancing, uh, six feet away uh, from everyone. And the rule at MIT has been that we should allow 160 square feet of usable space uh, per person, right? Uh, and 
and the flow in people in, of, in buildings should potentially also be monitored, uh, potentially also with frequent cleaning. And we wanted to collect best practices and working with what's called EHS, but it, it's the Health and Safety uh, and Environment Office right uh, at MIT. So these slides, actually, I took them in May 1st, right? And things really happened afterwards, uh, kind of, uh, you know, based on uh, what uh, we mentioned here, where people were following, uh, uh, yeah, thanks for the translation, uh, to collect the best uh, uh, practices. Um, so the ramp up, you know, that was based on inputs from our PIs and so principal investigators. So that includes faculty, but also researchers. So it's basically, you know, they would determine how they would do things. And MIT ended up following the same practice in the sense if some P if there are some PIs even in robotics today that have not yet brought back their research labs uh, online, right, for various reasons why you have some people that as soon as it was announced, like the next, next day, they, they were ready. And, you know, we wanted to make sure that the PIs would discuss with their respective research groups and collect data, right, on what uh, they wanted to do. And so that's what we followed. And that data was provided uh, to us. And so we set up a web system, right, to, ca to gather thoughts and plans so that we would be ready, right? So that's what we had done by May 1st. And then MIT actually announced, uh, you know, the plans for the research ramp up uh, later in, in May and the actual research ramp up started in June 15, right? And we wanted to have a web system that is flexible. So we have our faculty is about 71, as I mentioned. Uh, the total uh, number of research PIs is of the order of 100 uh, or so. And the research, right, and the COVID-19 situation is evolving, right? More and more people understand the states, the US, MIT has new rules and regulation. And so we didn't want to redo everything that we had done before. And so it's basically the web system was in some sense where the faculty would put their notes if you want, and in such a way that they would be able to update those things and also us make it easy for the management viewpoint, such that we would not have to do all of this by email, right? If for if you have for every person, you have 20 emails and you multiply that by 100, that's 20 times 100, right? So the, the numbers get relatively big very quickly and that's assuming you only email one person, right? Usually the number is much larger. And so we, you know, each PI could organize their details. The density would be limited per group and it can be increased or reduced as needed. So there was some initial thought that the, really the zeros plan was two person maximum that never marginalized and materialized. It became right away 25%. And then 50% is what we are in now, right? And those, we, we were happy, right, that MIT followed the same uh, rules as, as came out of our discussions. So continuing, right, so we completed uh, around uh, by May 1st, right, we completed the data collection, right, uh, document on the possible ramp up for Mickey. Right, we gathered inputs from the Mackey Space Advisory Council. So I had set up that council, uh, uh, you know, which is a previous chair uh, of Gang, Gang Chen, right, that you, some of you most likely know, Ron Abernarty, uh, that you uh, may know, and Garrett McKinley was in my role uh, like uh, 10 years ago. Uh, so this was to provide continuity in the space uh, decisions and I thought that that was needed because in part like I may not really know all of the details and you, and so there is a memory and I've actually worked on creating a memory so we we record all the notes of all our meetings such that like if Dan has my job later and I have Dan's job in, in the future right Dan can pretty much start from where Pierre was and, and then improve upon what was done before so you don't start from scratch. And so that was the idea of the Space Advisory Council to create a memory and also to provide advice. Then we gathered inputs 
uh, from our space team and uh, health and safety uh, team. So we have a health uh, and safety person in each department. So that's Dan Herrick uh, to try to avoid accidents and things like that. Uh, Joanne Matias is our administrative officer. Tom Grafeo is our facilities coordinator. So is the person you know, in charge of the labs and constructions renovations uh, for our lab working with me. And Sarah Collins is an administrative assistant that uh, was discussing. So we have meetings this, I mean, right now we just started meetings three times per week, but before like in the height of the ramp up, it was uh, meetings every day. Um, and we updated the web system. So we created, as I mentioned, that's Aris Christie's uh, IT person. And so that was the setup uh, that we did. And that web system, right, is the, the goal uh, was to collect preliminary data. So that was before MIT had really made decision, right, of a possible research ramp up plan for our Mickey community. And it was not at the time on May 1st, you know, a final plan nor a request for approval. I don't necessarily, I'm not really a person that pushes for policy or like a, that kind of a attitude, but more a data sharing and, and, a, 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 and a collection uh, viewpoint more than a policy. Uh, since every, especially in mechanical engineering, but I assume it, it's also the case in other, uh, other activities, the depending of what you do, the situation, like if you're a nano lab person or if you're a computational engineering person, or if you build, build big machines, or if you're robotics, or if you're in uh, energy, right, or in bioengineering, you have very different requirements. And so as the situation evolves, right, you can update your plans by revisiting the page and updating your, your own answers, right? And we also wanted, as new inputs were provided, so from the faculty uh, suggestions, actually we changed some of the things that we wanted to do. And then as MIT provides guidance, right, we had to adapt as well uh, our website. So here are some of the guidelines and definition, right, that MIT provided. So as I said, you know, hundreds, the phase one was 160 square feet of space per person. Uh, and the maximum number of persons per room, it is limited in all cases by that number, right? And so we provided uh, a website with all the floor plans of all the labs uh, for faculty to utilize with the amount of square feet per uh, room. And right, the maximum number of persons per lab at any given time, right, we indicated that uh, on uh, the plan and that was based on a density of research, right, that I will define uh, soon and actually uh, right now. And so here the density in research, right, and the office space uh, was referred to the ratio of the number, maximum number of people in the lab or office space at any, at any given time uh, to the, the, the number of person, right, that you can afford within uh, COVID. And so it's basically, if the no operating conditions are 50 hours per week per person, that gives you, if you have 10 people, for example, that would be time 10 times 50, that would be 500 hours per week, right? If you divide that uh, by 50%, right, it means that you would, can do 250 hours uh, of work per week. And then you distribute those hours, right, according uh, to the number of people that actually want to return to campus since the return to campus was uh, optional, right? So if you have people that did not want for many different reasons to come back to campus, we cannot really force them, right, to come uh, to campus. Uh, so the only access, right, uh, that was allowed, it was your designated lab spaces or research spaces. Right, so you normally not allowed to go in other research labs in phase one. And so, for example, right, you, at the beginning, you could not go to office spaces, right, except for specific activities. While, for example, while you're waiting for a lab, you cannot have food or coffee in common lab areas, right? What we did, we set up specific conferences with signage uh, that would indicate the num maximum number of people that you could have in a room. 
and you're required to clean after you have left. And usually there's a time like uh, 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 of 10 minutes uh, before use and reuse by another person. You cannot do gathering in hallways or lingering in open spaces or before research work. Usually we have for eating spaces, right? Uh, we um, would actually recommend to eat outside. So I see that Mo Mohi Mansour asked a question, right? Will be there be any limit on the number of working hours and working days? Can the work be done on 24 seven? So uh, normally, normally that, that's allowed, but the total number of working hours, right? Has been limited by MIT as 50 hours per person per week. So that means that's the maximum. So if they work in the middle of the night, uh, you know, so be it, but per person is only uh, 50 hours. So uh, redoing the computation as an example, if you have 50 people, uh, sorry, 10 people, then the total number of hours uh, that can be worked is 10 times 50, so that's 500 working hours. They can be distributed during the day, uh, including during the night, but that's the total maximum. So if you work at 50% capacity, right, you would have to divide that 500 hours, which is your maximum for 10 people, by two. So that would give you 250 hours. Now you divide that to your group according to the needs of the research. So there may be two students, for example, or two researchers that really require to be in the lab. So they work at 50 hours. So let's say it's two of them. That would be two times 50, 100. So now you only have left only 150 hours to redistribute to the other eight people in your group, right? And maybe each of them takes uh, 150 divided by eight, right? And they, because they don't need to come. Then within each lab, there is a density limit per lab, right? That tells you that those, for example, if your lab uh, is 160 square feet, you can only fit one person at a time. And so then you need to have people that circulate, uh, you know, accordingly, right? When maybe you had in general three or four people working in the same room uh, uh, each time. So that's what I'm talking about now, right? So two person per lab is commonly necessary, right? To ensure the safety and uh, uh, over the buddy system. That's happening pretty much now in, in uh, phase two. In phase one is a little bit more challenging. So we, you know, we had special arrangements for specific experiment, either, you know, doing a Zoom body. So it's basically they would see what was going on uh, if the person was alone or just trying to avoid that altogether uh, if it was possible. For shared lab space, so we have a lot of labs that is shared, right? So we had to think about that. And so the space manager, right, or the lead PI was coordinating. And usually we recommended to submit the single answer for the whole, or at least the coordinated answer for the shared lab space, such that, you know, you don't have overcrowding of the space. So for example, if you have a shared lab with three people that, uh, three PIs that work in the lab, if everybody comes in the same time in the lab, right, that would be uh, not respecting the, the safety and the health guidelines. And so that's why we needed to have the manager of the shared lab be in charge of that. And again, I didn't really want to have me or the administration of our department do that, right, for the shared lab space. Usually they do all the decisions uh, by themselves. And I didn't see why, because of COVID, right, we need to change that. So that, that's actually a principle I've tried to follow is that even though it is a COVID situation, Right, you still want, if at all possible, to maintain the same kind of responsibilities and uh, management that you had before, right? Otherwise, it looks like you're policing, right? What people would do. Obviously, you know that that require to be able to do that. That requires trust, right? So that you can trust that everyone is going to follow the health guidelines, and that I will talk about for phase two, uh, how we're going to try uh, to do that in an efficient uh, way, and. You know, we we're planning phase one, phase two, and phase three, and they're actually, uh, you know, are happening since we're now in phase two. And I assume there will be a phase three uh, coming at some point. So for office page, 
uses, right? And it was mentioned in potentially phase two and phase three, but that's still not allowed. Right, so in phase two, it might be rediscussed uh, in a few weeks from now. But uh, if you have to reboot your computer, make computer cluster update, pick up something in your office, those things right, are presently uh, allowed. Right? But you need to either request a one-time access right, that is managed by uh, MIT. Uh, so obviously, the different phases right, may not be activated. Uh, at the moment, they have been fought with, they have actually be, followed the order. At the time in May, we were not sure, like, is the pandemic going to continue growing, right, or to decay? So we created health and safety guidelines. I'm happy to uh, review that if you want, but we will see that on the website uh, soon. Uh, but overall, right, without going into the uh, details, here's some examples, right? All RAMPA plans assume that adequate Testing is available. So when you come back to MIT for research, right, you have to get a COVID test. You get the results the next day in 24 hours. That is actually quite well managed, at least to my, my standards uh, by MIT. I've done the test uh, myself. And so you have to uh, go to MIT Medical. They make you turn around. Uh, you know, they know you from uh, your MIT ID number. Uh, there is no contact uh, with anyone and uh, that, that's quite well organized. Uh, the PPE, so for protective uh, equipment, uh, you, as I mentioned before, you're required to wear a mask and use uh, gloves if needed uh, at all times. That has been uh, relaxed, right? The gloves and social distancing is, is uh, needed. Uh, for the mask wearing, like there has been a few people that did not do that, right? So out of uh, like our Mekki, we're about, uh, if you remove the, we have about 500 undergrad. And so if you remove them, we have about 600. Uh, also people right now, including researchers, postdocs, grad students, faculty. And we, I've heard like reports, uh, maybe six or seven reports. And sometimes it was people from facilities or even the police Right, they were forgetting to wear the mask uh, when they were congregating. Um, but a safety protocol right, has been discussed and is now available uh, right, uh, from MIT. And I will describe uh, how we, uh, we will try to ensure uh, uh, um, that the safety uh, regulations and recommendations are followed. So, an example of safety information that was provided, right? So at the time in May, there was still the concept of touching surfaces was uh, challenging, right? And so it's basically, you're supposed to clear uh, doorknobs and handles uh, and use uh, push buttons to open doors, wash faucet handles with soap, use paper towels to close faucets, etc. right? Uh, these kinds of things. Uh, Okay, so Dan mentions you've heard about delayed results in COVID testing, like seven days in other parts of the U.S. No, so at MIT, like I also have heard this, like, you know, I heard it also this weekend, uh, Dan, and, you know, at MIT, like you, at least from my understanding, you get the results the next day, right? So they do some of that testing, uh, I think, in-house, right? And so that goes a lot quicker than one week. And that's actually, I've heard in the other parts of the U.S., you can wait two weeks, Right, and so that that's not so useful in the sense, you know, I go take a test, and then I think, you know, I mean, what are you going to do for two weeks? Like in quarantine, waiting for the test results, most likely not. And so then, if you get sick, and if by two weeks, right, you get the test, that's too late, right? Uh, so it's basically you need to do sufficiently frequent testing, and the results need to come quick enough, right? Okay, good question then. And so, you know, unfortunately we cannot not talk very much, right? So that's a little bit of the lack of uh, fun, uh, but basically, you know, talking without mask, uh, not really uh, a good idea, right? And so this was again, the guidance in May. I just wanted to show you the history since I don't really know like where things are uh, in Egypt and I apologize uh, for that, but 
at the time, right, it was not so clear if things were aerosoled or not, but it seems now more and more, right, that that, that is happening. And so that's why masks are highly uh, recommended. So here is a, the first announcement, right, from MIT about the research uh, plan. And so that came uh, on May 19. The actual MIT start, they had some issues, right, with their web system. Uh, so we were ready with our things, but, you know, I think they put quite a lot of uh, pressure very quickly on the uh, infrastructure of the information system and technology at MIT. And so it took them a little bit of time, which they, there may be one mistake, you know, that, that was done is that they should actually already have said, you know, let's give one month, right? If you look at the time you announce and then you give one month, right? To get people in gear and they said, oh, it's going to be done in two weeks. And when I was looking at that, there is no way, right? They're going to be done in two weeks. Like we have been working on that web system for just our small in quote mechanical engineering department, but it's still, if you ignore the undergrad, which are about 500, as I say, is about 600, 700 people. So it's not small, but at MIT scale, it is small. And so it seemed to me, right, that, that they needed more time. So make sure, like one, as I said, I don't like to give recommendations to other people, but maybe I'll give one, depending on where you are, make sure to announce soon enough and to give enough time to your team, whoever is managing, right, all the logistics, the safety and the health to prepare and get ready. Like they are human beings and they need, they need time, right? And they don't want to do mistakes, so it's better to be slow. Otherwise, this is kind of the ramp up. So, you know, on May 18, right, the email was actually sent on May 19. That's when they started doing pilots. And at the time, they were not sure when the ramp up phase one, right, was going to start. They were indicating like June 1st, but it actually only happened June 15. And so that was 25% of capacity, right, on campus. Um, the phase two, right, uh, started on July 15th. And so just a few weeks, uh, I mean, one week ago, and that's 50% capacity on campus, right? And faculty now and PIs, right, are submitting uh, their updated plan, right, for that. And, you know, phase three would be less and less virtualizable research and most likely more uh, office uh, use. And I don't know when that will start office use maybe in a few weeks, uh, but you know, that has not been uh, clarified. So as part of this, uh, I thought was well sought out uh, from, from MIT, right? So as part of the research uh, ramp up, what they focused on, right, is they divide things in two parts. So one was the space planning and the other part was personal planning. And so they first were in the phase one, Right, they first focused in the first week to ex what's called exercise A, which is the space planning. Right, so you review your floor plans for your rooms under control. So we provided all those plans right to every PIs uh, in Mackey. So we you work, you know, each labs work with colleagues uh, on shared equipment plans, as I discussed before. So we had actually, you know, thought about those things uh, uh, before with inputs from our faculty and PIs. Then you can discuss and refine. You make the four plan, right, that uh, indicates the allowable uh, space. So as I said, 160 square feet was the guidance uh, of the exercise A for phase one. Then we designated, right, a COVID-19 monitor that has been usually the person in charge of health and safety. Um, there is other type of uh, person that I will talk about for phase two and, and a little bit later. Then, you know, we had to do health checks so that we decided that the person uh, for safety uh, in the lab uh, would do that uh, from the Mackey side directly. And so is really uh, Dan Herrick, which is our uh, environment and health and safety inspector that did all those checkup lists, right, since labs had not been open for quite some time. We only found a few uh, uh, minor issues like of uh, you know, when we restarted, uh, like some power switch that needed to be repaired and things like that, but nothing special, even though things had not been going on for almost two months and a half. Then the PIs, right, have to complete their exercise A uh, checklist and submit the plans 
DLC is basically the departments, and that we had built our website right uh, to allow that in a, in, and I will show that uh, soon. So the second part is personal planning, and so you first determine right who require who needs to require on campus, who is allowable uh, in in your personal. You have to discuss right each labs with uh, your lab, as I said. Some people have some immune system difficulty or other things. Uh, then you develop weekly work schedules um, and you discuss, uh, you know, how you want who needs to come to campus and who doesn't. Then you complete what's called what they called an exercise B. So it's basically a spreadsheet uh, that tells when people are planning to come back and for how many hours and that you know, every person has to complete a training uh, to make sure that they learn the latest uh, guidelines. And then they submit, right, the exercise B. And that, you know, as I said, it was June 1st, right? I thought that was a little too exaggerated. So they gave one week for exercise A, one week for exercise B. So we were ready by June 1st in mechanical engineering. But, you know, we need to wait another two weeks because MIT had not really built up their system. And so if you think at the university level, like, I think it's better to just give enough time, right, for people for building the web system or to actually start uh, uh, sooner. So here's an example of the what we had uh, set up, right, then I, I will go to the uh, actual website. But basically, you know, you enter your lab size, number of grad students, number of undergrad, uh, your name, a PI name. And, you know, we had thought that the first plan would be at 25%. You know, that, that was correct. And so, the, and now we are reopening at 50%. And so, you know, we wanted to get an ID uh, from every PIs how they planned on doing this, like in some writing. And so the ID was not it was for us to collect some information, learn potential issues that may come up that we would need to address. But it was also for each group, right, to by themselves think about how they want to operate, right? So again, it was also notes to the groups at least that was the intent of uh, collecting data, not necessarily policing, but such that people would decide within their group of how they want to operate. Right. So I think here, uh, in summary, I'll summarize phase one, and then I will go to the website. Uh, actually, maybe I can also describe you phase two, and then we can do the website the demo afterwards. So for phase one, so that was the status uh, you know, at the beginning uh, of July, we had 74 PI requests. We have a few more rooms now, but 108 research rooms, uh, 10 shared labs and core facilities were open, right? So we developed new capabilities. So as part of this web system building, right, since everything is remote, I thought that, you know, if we do something new, we also need to learn along the way such that when COVID is over, right, we have built new capabilities. And so we're using a, a quick base uh, web system, right? So it's local citizen development software. What does that mean? It's basically a software that's actually very easy to build web pages, right? And, imp and collect data and manage uh, in an easy way. So even if you don't really know too much about a system, uh, or software is very easy to use, right? And so I thought that if we gain knowledge for that, it would be useful for other purposes. And we also wanted to have a website, as I mentioned before, that people can just update and add very easily, right? So it's dynamic because the situation is changing uh, constantly. So we created a PPE, right? Uh, supplies ordering system. Uh, I, I can go to that website if you want, but basically it's, it is monitored by MIT, so you have to, it's only the AO and our assistant that can upload, but we created a system such that every PI can place the order and then we deliver, right, uh, the supplies. We may change that now where people from each lab would come on a specific day to pick up, right, what they need. We added signs everywhere, like the maximum occupancy in each lab. Uh, all that signage at specific conventions provided from MIT, you know, and we created a safe a eating space, a safe eating spaces. Uh, again, recommending since it's the summer uh, that people can eat outside. And so phase two, right, as I said, that was early July. That was a faculty a lunch presentation. 
And so in 50% capacity, and it started like on June 15th, oh, sorry, July 15th. And they created a new one-time access process, right? Uh, so for people that just want to come to their office or pick up something, and that is working uh, decently. They're also doing a module for vendor access. So there's a lot of external companies right, that come to manage gas lines, to add equipment, to repair, to monitor. And that they're a little, MIT is a little bit delayed. Now the latest is that they would be ready by August 15th. So that, that is something that you want to think about also is that if you have people external from the university that are coming to your campus uh, to do uh, various things or to add new equipment, remove equipment, uh, you, you need a way to allow uh, that. And the one-time access right at the moment does not require a COVID test anymore, it used to. So if you just come to campus for like half an hour or an hour, uh, you need to go to the approval and the training, you need to wear a face mask, but you're not required to do a COVID test uh, anymore. And obviously us, you know, you also have in addition to the COVID uh, stories, we have the Mackey space upgrades, renovations uh, and operations. So I'll show the uh, phase two part, that's the uh, last slides and then we will go to the uh, website. So phase two, right, I said, uh, it was announced July 15, but it's, we started July 17, uh, right? That was during the weekend. And so what is different is we reduced MIT, reduced right, the density. So now it's 125 square feet per person instead of 160 square feet per person. Uh, that based on new health guidance, right? That, that, that was actually uh, fine. And they added more research capacity and working hours so it was up to 50% from 25%, right? So um, before coming back to my example, if you're a group of 10 people, 50 hours, that's uh, 500 working hours. If it's 25%, right, that was about 125 uh, hours, 50%, you go up to 250 hours, right? So those are the main change. And you had to resubmit right, exercise A and exercise B. So the floor plan needs to differ, right, since you can have more people per square foot, per, per the density, but also the number of working hours. And we had built the system such that, you know, people can upload and re-upload those things. Uh, as I mentioned, the novelty, right, is the monitoring and the compliance is that each PI, right, now not as to nominate a COVID-19 ambassador. And so here is to try to help with the culture Right, so it's basically, it is impossible for me, right, or anybody to check what 600 people are doing at, at each time, right? So that needs to be localized and you need to try to educate people so that we are good citizen. And I find that that may help in the future for other things. Like once we trust everybody, like part of your administration, right, you, you're sometimes quoted as bad, like we try to not really help people. Usually that's all we do is try to do the right thing and help people as much. That's why we're here, right? Is to help our colleagues. And so not necessarily to police, but to help. And so by having someone in the group, right, that helps monitor. So we have had several that have helped us, right? So you open a door of where you're supposed to eat and there's 10 people from facilities there eating when they're not supposed to be there. And so that, you know, can be reported and we can try to prevent from having that not happening or people not wearing masks when they're supposed to, right? And that the ambassadors can help that or people working more hours than they are allowed, right? Again, it's impossible, right, to check uh, all of this. And so it's to try to, I hope that that will work, is that if you establish trust, right, at all levels, so within your lab, from the lab, within your unit and inside the department, I think if that gets established and works well, it will really help us in the future when we want to collaborate for research or other things or for space, right? And as I mentioned before, the return to campus, right, at the moment is still voluntary. So nobody is required to be on campus if they don't want to go to campus for uh, any reasons. That may change in the future, like in the sense, it, it might be more that if you have health reasons, right, that you cannot go to campus, uh, but you would not go. Otherwise, at some point, 
like they and my team may require if you don't have any health issues right to come to campus uh, at, at least uh, you know for a minimum number of required time but i'm not sure if they will do that they, they are talking about it but i don't know what they will do okay so uh, we're going to go to the research uh, ramp up web form right so i'm going to uh, stop sharing maybe this and uh, go to the website if there are any questions, uh, now is maybe a good time. Uh, I see a question in the chat about uh, yeah. contact tracing. Have we implemented something like that? No, so they did not do that. But if some, luckily nobody has been found sick at MIT so far, right? And I find it that's incredible. Uh, you know, there's about 20,000 or so people. I think the number of people on campus is maybe 4,000. And, and uh, they found nobody sick in the test. Like, uh, so um, that they're quite proud of this. I think it's a little bit of luck. I mean, around Cambridge, the, you know, they, there's only about like 3,000 or so people that have been sick out of 100,000. So not, not too bad. I think total number of deaths is 99 uh, that are related to COVID uh, since it started. Um, this may change. Uh, um, I, I think uh, as part of phase two, right, since they, that's also part of the compliance is that you have to enter your daily working hours and so this way they will be able from that data, right, to try to see, okay, this person in this lab, right, has been in contact with all of those people and then uh, contact them. Uh, so, but they have not implemented like a phone application or an automated system for contact tracing. I mean, uh, I think they could do that for in a voluntary sense. I think imposing these kinds of things, especially in the US, you know, you have very different opinions and, and you will have people that will feel very much against, right? Uh, this as well as some people that would feel very 100% uh, for it. So that, I think they have talked about it, but they haven't found yet a way that would accommodate like all of the difference in opinions. So I'll show quickly a little bit the website since I talked about it. So normally you should see um, the website. So that's the web form right here. That's the web form. Uh, let me see the web form. This should be um, phase one, right? So we had written text here. You have the guidance. So that's 27 pages, right, of guidance from MIT. Uh, you know, we tried to distill that to the most useful part. If you click here, right, you can have access to all of the floor plans with room sizes. I'll just do that for a second, uh, right? So you get to a group box, you have student rooms, research on campus rooms, right? Uh, so now you should go back here. I mean, the figures that I showed, right? So they can also show up. I'm not sure actually if you show it on the screen, I'm not sure. Um, but basically, okay, um, yeah, so I went back to phase two, I'm going back here, phase one, right? So these were the key dates. As I said, they were pushing June 1st. I thought that was crazy, right? That they would not be ready. And in fact, they were not. We were only ready on June 15th. Uh, these are all the details, instructions. Even after we tried to distill it, it's still a little bit complicated. But the research, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to provide this, like if it helps you, like I can email Dan, like all the documents so that you, you would have that information for you. But here was like the names, if you have a shared lab, the lab size, I already showed you this, right? Uh, specific equipment needs from our PIs or faculty, other personnel that might come later, uh, the monitoring on the lab, right? So it's basically the, the monitor part Here's the exercise A, right, where you have to upload your four plans. And you can change those, right? You can come back and re-upload. And for exercise B, that was for the personal. So phase one was at 25%, right? Here you have all the instructions and you can upload them. And if you have to shut down, right, we add those questions or you have some health and research challenges. Like we also thought it was good to mention this. 
and special health consideration, why right, it was another reason. So now in phase two, right, things are similar. Um, so like phase one is not available anymore, right, since we're in phase two. So you actually, we have updated the website. As I mentioned, you have a, the adjustment, right, 125 square feet from 150. And there is instructions, right, how to do the floor plans. You have to write dots of where people are going to be sitting, etc. And you can have more uh, research capacity per hour, so 50% for 25%. At the moment, visiting students and scholars, right, can be included if they were uh, there before March 20. Undergraduates are still not allowed to do research on campus, but they will be allowed in the fall. And again, you've got the detailed instructions and then you enter like your name is a little simpler here, just directly exercise A, like the floor plans basically. And exercise B is just an Excel sheet uh, with a specific format and that you upload and then it comes up here. Now the back end, right, so that you see, so all of that then gets transferred right to a quick base system. And so here you will see the back end of that quick base system. So this is phase one. You may remember it was 108 research rooms. Now we have 112, right? And here you see all the faculty names, all of their floor plans, right? So, you know, I'm sure you may recognize some of those names, um, uh, you know, with all the data. So we have your favorite colleague, uh, Dan, and, Dan and I are also good friend, well, at least I, I, I always, since I arrived at MIT, I always learned a lot from him. He always took good care of me, so uh, like he's my big brother. So, but then his floor plan is here, right, was his number of people. And so here you have the name of the PIs, all the rooms, right, and I can show you a little bit. So now, for example, in phase two, right, um, so if you go here, right, and so it's basically this is how we operate on the back end, checking everything. Right, so in MIT has really appreciate what we have done because we don't have mistakes and things like that since we do all this checking. So ramp up request ready for approval, right? Exercise A, exercise B, ready for upload. Do they need review? Exercise A and exchange. So here we still have some work done to be for exercise A of these two faculty and work done on exercise B, right? And here, these are all the things that have been submitted and uploaded uh, so far, so we just started a, a phase two, right, very recently. And here we also have the core facilities, teaching labs, etc., that we are uh, setting up. And so if you really want, and we have all comments, maybe I could show mine if you want. Uh, I can show you this so if I look at my name right here. So let me see, maybe I should come up. Uh, yeah, the, um, so here, this is all of your ramp up request. Yeah, it's going to be hard. I mean, it looks complicated, but it's not that complicated. Let me see if I see my name. I've seen it. Uh, let's see it. Uh, I think it's because I've it might have just one second. Yeah, so this is all the submission. Uh, I need. It's a little difficult with uh, uh, the sharing the screen because I actually don't really see everything that I'm supposed to see. And so I get a little confused. I will try one more. Somehow this is very strange that my name doesn't show up there. I It was there before. I don't know what I did. Uh, I may have put some filters. Anyway, I'll, I'll just open one. So like if you edit, for example, here, you have the lab. And so we created all these boxes, right? So this is for David Wallace. Uh, you have specific, so in, in orange, right? That's what we write. And so here you see all the floor plans that show up and here we enter all kinds of comments, right? Or what we have done, who has checked room. So Pierre has approved, et cetera, I've made the updates. We allow like many exercise B that can be uploaded. Uh, these are all the comments. 
right? And then you can click here, like approved by room. So Joanne here approved this, has been uploaded. So it's basically we build all the system, right? So that everything can be checked uh, and uh, imported uh, to the MIT website. So, and I will stop here. Like I, Dan had told me that uh, finishing about 10 minutes before the start uh, would be a good plan. And so I'm willing, you know, if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask. And if there's some information that you found useful that, uh, you know, if you want to see like how, like all the guidelines, et cetera, like I'm happy to share and, and uh, help as much as possible if, if there's help uh, that, that can be provided. But again, coming back to what I said at the beginning, you know, you should really do what is good for your institution and maybe take some of what we're doing, but not all and adapt, uh, right? So that you respect the culture and the habits and the research uh, customs uh, in, in Egypt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pierre. Okay, so I'm scanning for questions. Yeah. Raised hand. Not seeing anything yet. Yeah, and don't be shy if you have any questions. Like there's no, no, uh, yeah. As I said, I'm just an old person. Uh, shouldn't be scared of any, and there's no bad questions. So I'll ask a, a single there was this provision. Question. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask a question I had myself. So this, there was this provision where if you were in a room that could really only accept one person and you need to do work that would normally need a buddy system, you just can bring someone up on the screen, like on Zoom, and they can monitor for you. Have, yep. have people actually been doing that or is that just yes theory? yes yes some people have done that the part where it's a little tricky is like let's say you're doing that and then you know for example let's say i'm in my i'm here in the lab right i'm doing something and then i have an accident like i cut my finger or something like that like okay it's better to have the zoom thing there than have nothing because you can call like an ambulance or something like that assuming that you're watching right but what people would really prefer is that if you have something going on the machine, that you have something there to just shut the machine down, right? And everything, or basically take a, a rapid action if there's a gas leak or if there's a fire, right? That you can help uh, right away. That's what people are most afraid of. And so from that viewpoint, Zoom helps a little bit. It's better than having nothing. And people have used it, but it's not as safe, right? As having another person. And so usually, like what others have also done, sometimes the labs can have, you know, it's a room with a door and they can have the door open. And so you have somebody else, right? Especially since they've, it's better to keep things open so that you have fresh air that comes in. Uh, is to have someone like next door that is maybe not right next to you, but that is nearby, right? And so then you can scream, hey, Dan, you know, I just cut my finger. Then obviously, like you need to come and, and help, right? Uh, like, and if you have a mask, like, you know, that, that would be better. Or if there's a fire or something like that. So people have used it. How effective is it? Uh, like if there is a real accident, uh, it's a little difficult. And then if you're on Zoom, like, are you really paying attention or are you doing something else? And then you forget, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's better than nothing, but it's not foolproof. I think um, Moi Mansour had, had a question. You can go ahead. Yeah, uh, I like actually your platform here and for the MIT platform that actually is making everything under control in terms of space, personnel, researchers, and everything. And uh, maybe this question for you, but also it's, uh, it's more like for us as uh, Egyptian universities, is any way possibility for sharing some kind of platform with the Egyptian university, if that's possible, or maybe Dr. Walid or Dr. Dia, do we need such kind of thing to be implemented at our side? Because I see it's not only 
for COVID. I think in the future as well, we need something like that. We need something to follow up and control the lab work. So that this is, this is a very nice platform. So it tells you everything and controlling all the activities. Right, yeah. I mean, me, I don't mind sharing. Uh, so like the, you know, that's definitely feasible. For example, like we could print a copy like of all the things that we have built so that you would see like a, a at least a printout, like a PDF copy. Uh, sharing the software may also be possible. Uh, like at least me, I don't have it. Like the, this is the world, right? We work together. Like why am I going to make you do something that I already have done, right? So there is no, like we're not making any money uh, or anything like that out of it. So if I can be useful and save some lives or make your life easier, uh, maybe one day you will make my life easier. So so that, this is good, yeah. So I don't have any, I'll ask and then maybe can follow up. But sharing all the documents, etc., everything we have, we can do. And sharing software, I don't see why, we, we, it, it, you know, I, I think it can be done. Yeah. Because at MIT, you have very good experience in this. And it's right. better to start from scratch. We don't have to, if we have such kind of collaboration, we don't have to start from scratch. We can just adopt some regulations according to the Egyptian needs, and then yes. we can just amend that. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm happy to, I mean, Dan can be a uh, you know, point of contact and uh, I'm happy to give uh, everything. I don't have, obviously we know we cannot give you people's data, but, but you know, the software and, and uh, like how it was set up, we can give you examples, yes. Okay, uh, Dr. Pierre, uh, thanks a lot for your representation. It was very helpful, very concise, informative, like everything is perfect in this one. I just want to mention to uh, Dr. Mohi uh, as well uh, that when we applied at Ain Shams University for accreditation, the Egyptian accreditation, we um, been asked to uh, have a risk management plan and risk management activities. And we formed a risk management group at our faculty and everything in the faculty is uh, run based on personal uh, monitoring. It's not uh, computerized or uh, modernized as you mentioned here. <laughs> so if I want to invite somebody uh, to uh, visit me at the university, I have to uh, issue a paper or uh, a note and I submit it to uh, the a responsible person and he is going to submit it to the security guard at the gate and then they write it on paper and when the uh, person I'm inviting uh, reached our uh, gates at the faculty they informed me uh, informed myself by by phone or, or, okay, or send somebody with him to my place so the same procedure is going on okay uh, without all of these regulations which is good to have it, okay? And all of them are based on personal communication. So for example, uh, if uh, some professor is working in a lab, he can't open the lab and work unless there is a technician, okay? Because the lab is, is res the responsibility of the technician. Yes. So the professor who owns the lab, okay, who is working in the lab, he can't work unless there is a uh, technician. And another person who is responsible for cleaning and all of this stuff. So for emergency cases, he has we have at least uh, three persons in the same location. And each building, we have a guard, personal guard, and he is responsible for the building. Each floor in the building, we have a personal guard as well. He's responsible for all uh, rooms in the buildings and all the laboratories. And in each laboratory, there is a technician and person responsible for cleaning. Uh, so for safety issues, we in the building, when uh, even we are having lockdown, at least there are uh, almost uh, 20, 30 persons in the, in the building. So for the person, the idea of safety, this is acceptable and it is working fine. And in the meantime, uh, fortunately, we have another building uh, beside our university, which is uh, like an ambulance, a small ambulance uh, host 
building and small hospital. So any action or any problem, we just open the door of the faculty, okay, and then we send this injured person to the to the hospital. And fortunately, it didn't happen a lot. Okay, it was minor uh, cases, and it went fine for this case. But as I mentioned, uh, all uh, checking all. Um, Notes are based on communication between the personnel who is responsible for the, the room or a building or whatever, or the guard and the main control center of the faculty. But I think it will be a good idea to move from uh, paperwork to uh, documentation and uh, to have um, an existing, uh, well done working um, like system as you have in MIT to start it to start with it uh, at any chance and adapt it to our case. So it will be like uh, plan B, okay, we have personal communication and at the same time we will have this documentation on the software. And the reason of having all of these uh, personal activities or personal uh, applications or personnel working in this area is the, their salary is around 50 to 100 US dollars per month. So it's not much. Yeah, okay, yeah. so it's, it's, yeah. if I want to go and buy a software, it's easier for me to get help from okay. personnel yes, and yes. you will get salaries so we will reduce the unemployment rate, okay, yes. in the meantime, but uh, if we have this model or this system as a documentation, okay, and uh, something to use it instead of having all of these human uh, beings inside the building, especially in cases of uh, like uh, COVID-19 or something like this. So it would be a good idea if we want to have a complete lockdown for the, for the uh, building itself, for the faculty itself. So it's a good idea, Dr. Mohi, if we can have something like this implemented at uh, HMS. And I think will be the case for Mansour and Aswan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you, I agree. Also, in, since I'm from Belgium originally, like, and also in France, they do have those technicians, right, in all the labs, etc. And it's too bad, you know, that in the U.S., you know, they don't have that because they actually play a role in you. Even as a student, you can be become friends with them, uh, yes. all the guards, etc. And they also have that in Italy. And then they can let you in, like, uh, if you have to work on the Saturday or on the Sunday. And, and so they, they, yeah, so that's something that the U.S. is somewhat missing a little bit. And it actually yes, helped, yes. Uh, you know, to, as you say, it also give them employment to people. So, like, they, it, it would not hurt the U.S. if we had a few more, right, of, of people like this that would help. And uh, either from the cleaning or the management uh, and, and the safety of, of, of buildings. Yeah, I, I, I think yes, I, I, feel, well. I feel comfortable when I find some human being with me to talk yeah, to him. Yeah, no, he no. Because those... He's Zoom monitoring. So he's monitoring me, not monitoring the case. This is the yes, situation. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, you still I have a, a coffee break, you can find somebody to talk to. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. As I said, you become friends, right? So because yeah, there's yes. a few students, like you're there working yes. all the time. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm still working all the time, but, uh, but, but it's basically then you have someone to talk to. So it has, it has, and also they become interested even in your research, right? They, they yes. ask, I mean, even at MIT, when I go to the bathroom, they ask, oh, Pierre, what are you doing? So are you teaching? Oh, oh. and what, what kind of work? Oh, you're not doing research? So you're not doing anything. So, <laughs> so, you know, they, yeah, so it's basically, you also have that friendship. Yeah, I yes. think it's very important. Yeah. Yes, very important. Thanks a lot for your presentation, really good. Excellent. You're welcome. Yes, I appreciate it. So I, I know you may have another meeting to go to, Pierre, so I, I don't yeah. want to keep you any longer than necessary, but I really very much appreciate your presentation. And uh, I, I should pass the baton to you now, Waleed. Yeah, okay, so thanks yeah. a lot. So if I, yeah, unfortunately, if I can, I, I had mentioned that to Dan, we actually have our a, a space and COVID-19 meeting and, a, a, you know, happening starting at 11 uh, 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 Boston time. So I will not be able to stay for the second part. But it's not that I don't want to you provide yeah, suggestion no or a system. It's more that I, I also have my job here. So, Yeah, I understand. 
Thanks Thank so you very much, much and best best of luck uh, for your respective universities and country in general. And hopefully, yeah. you know, we, we will be in a better place soon. Yes. Thank, you. So. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then. <laughs> so uh, I'll start the next part of the presentations. <laughs> so today we have a presentation from Enchamps University and a presentation from Aswan University. Uh, fortunately for me, I am going to moderate and uh, deliver the presentation of uh, uh, Dr. Bia. Uh, he, had, he has a, a unplanned uh, meeting, but it was very important. So he had to go because he's heading this meeting. Okay, so this is uh, my uh, luck to be with you for this one and moderating and providing his presentation. So let me share with you uh, Dr. Zdia uh, presentation. And uh, please, if you have any uh, question, uh, ask me, interrupt and ask me if you want. So this it's is... Small. Uh, Sorry, just a small adjustment, Professor Walid. Uh, today's presentations are Ayn Shams and Mansoura. Um, I, I, we will not be featuring a, an Aswan presentation today. Okay, did I say the Aswan? Yes. Oh. yes. Okay, sorry, sorry for that. No I, meant, I, I meant Mansoura, and uh, I think we have uh, Dr. Osama Abderrahim. Okay. Yes. So, I thought sorry, so that you do that for Aswan as well, Dr. Walid. Oh, thanks a lot. I take the, the whole package today. Yeah, okay. Um, let me start with the presentation here for Rheinshams University. So uh, at the beginning, I'm going to uh, mention uh, how does it look like the grad studies at our faculty and then what uh, we did during the COVID-19 uh, period at the beginning and till now. So for our case here, uh, you see my presentation, right? Is it uh, yeah. okay? Yeah, you may you may put it on the show. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. So for the postgraduate studies at Ain Shams, uh, especially for the research uh, part, uh, we have a couple of uh, numbers here. We have around uh, forty-five uh, postgraduate programs. Uh, they are divided between masters, master of science, master of engineering, and uh, diploma and the PhD degrees. We have around 333 courses offered in spring uh, 2020, this term, and this is considered to be a huge number of uh, postgrad uh, courses. And in these postgrad courses, we have almost uh, 1,050 students registered in, this, in these uh, courses. They are almost one third of the total number of uh, graduate students at our faculty. Of course, uh, the students will take uh, their courses only in the first year and then or first and second year and then they continue doing the thesis. So to have 1,050 students attending classes in the spring 2020 during this COVID-19 it was a disaster for us. Uh, what we are going to do, how can we uh, going to adjust this period because they only stay for two years. This, their programs is almost two years if it's a master's or a diploma and then they have to leave so everything is very very squeezed and we have to arrange for alternative ways to make sure that they uh, pass their um, assigned uh, programs and they take their degree as well uh, so for uh, postgraduate diplomas they take courses only for master uh, and uh, master of engineering and master of science they take uh, courses, it's almost around 10 courses and a thesis for a Master of Science and uh, 10 courses and two other, uh, one course and one project for Master of Engineering. The duration of the Master is almost uh, two years minimum and they have to provide one research application at the end and this research should be um, accepted by Scobus so it has to be with a good uh, academic weight. For a PhD student, they are going to attend four courses. This is like the foundation year for a PhD student. And then they continue three years uh, minimum uh, for a thesis uh, research and the work and uh, 
writing and then the defending at the end. So the minimum for the PhD studies is uh, a three years minimum period, and they have to have two minimum two publications. Um, they have to be Scopus um, approved, and uh, if uh, they, these activities are um, published in a, um, international uh, journals, it will be with a good weight and it will help uh, the student during his uh, defense. At the same time, uh, we, uh, during this period, we are uh, modifying the graduate studies bylaws and we are building what's called the new uh, credit hour uh, postgraduate uh, bylaw. We are having all courses as one pool uh, for the faculty and any student can take from their department, some courses from their department, and they can take some extra courses from other departments based on an approval from his supervisor and the department chair. And this is a good uh, opportunity to have this interdisciplinary um, activities between departments as well, and to engage the student not only into research in his uh, specialization, but to go around and see what's, uh, what's going to link between his research or his topic with other topics in uh, related topics in other departments. Also, we initiated what's called uh, GESC, uh, which is Graduate Engineering School for Research. And in Arabic, it's uh, GESC, it's like a bridge, so it has the double meaning here. So this is good for us. And we started this GESC in 2017 or late 2016. And this entity is under the umbrella of the postgraduate studies, but they are concerned more with the activities related to or the master of engineering uh, activities related to uh, multidisciplinary uh, fields. So we have under this uh, research entity, we have two master of engineering uh, programs. One of them is research uh, based on um, uh, efficient resource, uh, resource cities. Uh, and this one is between uh, civil engineering, electrical, mechanical, and uh, architecture engineering. So it includes all courses from different disciplines in the engineering faculty. The other master of engineering program is the new and renewable energy program, which we used to call it Jamila. And this is a combination between courses in electrical and mechanical, uh, mechanical discipline as well. So this is how does it look like in our faculty and especially the load which we have in spring 2020, which we are thinking how to overcome this area or how to, how to overcome these problems under the COVID-19 dis disruption. So we turn everything to be online, all courses, uh, the 333 courses delivered to the students, they, we change it from on-campus to online courses. All of uh, the online courses, uh, they uh, um, were done using uh, Zoom sessions, uh, team, uh, Microsoft team, some uh, professor, they, uh, they have their PowerPoint presentation and they, they record videos and then they deliver it to the students and after that, uh, they assign a certain time for a Zoom discussion. Uh, as we mentioned, we have 333 cores and we have almost 10, uh, around 1,050 students. So the number of students in each course is not much. Some of the courses, they have two uh, students. Some of them, they have 15 or 20 students. So it was manageable to go for online uh, presentations or online activities for these courses. And it went fine, actually. For the master's and the PhD defense, uh, we had a, um, a rule indicating that uh, no audience should be existing uh, in the day of uh, defending the thesis. Only the student and one of the committee members has to be in the, uh, the faculty, the premises of the faculty. They can't be done uh, through Zoom or online uh, defense. It has to be inside the faculty. And the rest of uh, the examiners, they can be on Zoom or online using any other uh, media channels. And no audience, as I mentioned, but if they want to join online, 
they can join online, of course, and no problem with that. So we decided uh, don't have, we don't have any, we are not going to have any uh, person inside the faculty from staff members or students, even in the undergrad or the grad level, unless there is a prior uh, permission uh, from uh, personnel who is responsible for these activities inside the faculty. So all seminars and all activities went uh, online as well. And all individual researchers who want to use the lab, they have to send a request, an official request to their supervisor. And their supervisor, he has to send a permission for or request to get a permission for this student to enter the faculty. He has to send it to the, the chair of his department. And all of these permissions will go to the vice chair uh, of graduate studies. And uh, upon his approval, we will go back uh, to get his approval sent to the um, guards on the, uh, on the gates to um, accept or to give a permission for this uh, grad student to enter the faculty in a certain day, in a certain time, to a certain lab or to a certain room. So we will have this monitoring as we, uh, I mentioned earlier, for the previous presentation, but all of them are going personal, not or personal communication, not based on a, a computerized uh, permissions. Uh, so for uh, what, what we actually have uh, did in our case, uh, the faculty here, uh, I just borrowed some of the items from the first presentation, which is the space planning and personal planning, and I added the activities planning, okay? Uh, so for the space planning, we decided to close all labs and uh, sterilize all labs in the faculty uh, unless there is a grad student who wants to use the lab or a professor wants to use the lab. We will inform the vice chair for grad studies and uh, to get a permission to sterilize this lab before and after his usage. So this is the space planning. If we can uh, say this is what we did. Uh, for personal planning, as I mentioned earlier, we didn't allow any person to go inside the university unless there is a, uh, from the staff or from the students, grad students, unless there is a permission earlier for him to go inside the faculty and do some work. Of course, the professors, they will go into their rooms, but to work in the lab, he has to send a request to the department chair as well is department chair. Uh, fortunately, okay, but we are going to change this uh, rule later. Uh, each department has its own labs and to get a permission, you have to get a permission from the chair of this department. But in the future, there is a plan. We started this plan two or three years ago, but it's under implementation at the faculty to have what's called uh, centralized labs. And for this centralized labs, there will be a an entity responsible for all of these labs. It, does, it will not belong to a certain department, but all of the equipments can be used by any faculty and any postgrad uh, as soon as he's mentioning or he's providing a proof that he belongs to uh, this department or, or he's registering in a certain department at our faculty. Uh, we also uh, issued a work from home uh, like uh, requests. So anybody who is going to work for his uh, master and PhD, unless he wants the lab, he can work from home. And then the professor uh, or the supervisor of this student will have um, a weekly or bi-weekly uh, Zoom meeting with him. The, the student, the postgrad student, he can work using simulation. He can do uh, research, uh, uh, theoretical research or literature review based on uh, his uh, uh, timing of the research. He can write papers. So we didn't waste all of this uh, period. But at the same time, to be fair for these students, maybe there are some students, they don't have, for example, laptop or they, they are not powerful enough to perform their activities. Uh, we decided uh, to have this period deducted, the, the, the lockdown of the faculty period, to be deducted from his total number of uh, research period. So if he has a maximum of five years research 
we will deduct six months or seven months depending on when we will allow the students to go back and use the full facility of the faculty and this uh, this decision is fair to most of the students to make sure that they are not harmed from any action we are taking during this period for the activities the planning we delayed uh, all uh, purchasing activities inside the faculty <laughs> okay and we freeze many uh, of the international collaboration activities as well uh, during this period we formed the uh, or we found a grow uh, interest growing interest for biomedical applications and we formed two activities or two teams inside the faculty uh, one local team is uh, going to uh, develop what we call uh, ventilators mechanical ventilators and uh, they are going to have what's called the uh, disinfecting uh, tunnel and they are working on them and the other group is working on the biosensing activities which is has a direct relation with the virus uh, spectral uh, sensing of uh, during this period and of course we are going to continue working on these activities even after the, we open the lockdown or open the faculty again and uh, accept the students to come again on the campus. Uh, I think um, this is the whole presentation. Okay, thank you uh, for listening to me. Stop sharing. Uh, so that's all for the um, presentation which I received from uh, Dr. Dia. Any questions? As I mentioned, I brought some titles from the first presentation, so uh, I found it very, very useful. And Dr. Mahi, as he mentioned, if we can have the same structure or the way of uh, uh, doing the regulation from MIT, it will be very, very helpful to have a complete uh, self-explanatory uh, um, uh, steps in our case here. Yeah, I think we can work together with Dan and yourself. Okay. Then we can actually build this in uh, in your faculty. It would be very yes, it will, it, it will be very very helpful in our case, and at the same time, it will be very helpful when we uh, show it to the uh, Egyptian accreditation body, the NACA, and maybe we will be the hub to expand this idea inside the other faculties, the Egyptian faculties or Egyptian universities, actually. Yeah, because it's not only, uh, I mean, uh, just controlling things, but also to, to look at the history and to get some statistical yes, yes. data. Uh, documentation is very important. We, we have it, but on a paper base, and I'm sure it will not be the same as you mentioned, the computerized. Uh, because if you want to have any uh, previous uh, activity or an incident, you have to go back to the paper work and then search and it's very, very difficult and it's time consuming and it's uh, like space consuming as well. And we are in an era of uh, digitalization. So exactly. this makes sense, and yeah. For decision making as well in the future, if you'd like to make a decision, you need to do that based on some information, based on some yes. data. And this is the one way to do that. Yes, we started the, based on a recommendation from the Egyptian accreditation body, Naqa we started to uh, have put a lot of uh, safety signs everywhere in the faculty, especially in the labs. And uh, we updated frequently and we started and put it in English because we used to use English everywhere. And then they said, you have to put it in Arabic also because some of the technicians and the people working in the lab who's responsible for cleaning, they don't know English. So you have to put it in Arabic. So we have uh, like, a progressive elaboration of the decisions which we took earlier and now in every lab you will have two uh, set of safety signs one in Arabic one in English and we update it frequently okay and at the same time we have it uh, we are checking the fire extinguisher and we have to sign and all of these uh, regulations they were not earlier existing but a couple of three or five years ago we started to have it uh, on a regular basis. But if we have a system, as you mentioned, to provide us with the monitoring and uh, where to look 
to which extinct shrimp deposit will be expired soon. It's something uh, related to like preventive maintenance uh, procedure. Okay, so in this case, I think it will be very, very helpful for us. So in the future plan for next fall, uh, do you think the capacity of researchers will be much more in the lab or you're still going on gradual uh, increase? Um, actually, for our case, uh, I think it will be the same case for other Egyptian universities. We don't rely mainly on labs, okay? For, especially for normal uh, uh, programs. Like, for example, in uh, the electrical power engineering, we don't use the lab unless there is an experiment related to power electronics, for example. But the rest of other program or uh, uh, concentrations inside the power, electrical power engineering, we use to use simulation. For, for computer, they use computer labs. And of course, all the grad students, they are working on their uh, computers as well. For communication, they need the lab because they can't form uh, a laser lab, okay, or they have a simulation, so they have to work on a, uh, a specific equipment uh, with a specific uh, characteristic. So it's uh, not a must to use the lab for all uh, fields, but during the uh, during the coming we coming uh, term, I think we will open the labs for all students because the students, the number of students. Uh, Working in the lab is not that much, especially for grad, of course. For undergrad, the it will be a completely different story. Because for undergrad, we will uh, have the students, the ca maximum capacity of 50% uh, working at the same uh, lab. So the capacity for undergrad is 50%. For grad, I think it will be 100% because the number of students, as I mentioned, using the lab is not much. And we can uh, change the time uh, they are using the lab. So some, some of them will work in the morning. Some, some of them will work in the afternoon because our faculty is open 24-7. Okay. May I ask, uh, on one of your slides, I think it indicated that PhD students are required to write two papers. Yes. Do they have to be accepted to journals or only submitted? or something else? No, the minimum is accepted. <laughs> like we are looking for a published papers and it has to be in a well-known uh, journal papers like uh, Elsevier, like IEEE. Um, this is what I have in mind now. <laughs> but if uh, they have an acceptance letter from this journal, uh, so we can accept because uh, it might take around one, one and a half year to be published. Okay. And at the same time, we, uh, in the acceptance letter, we look when he submitted his uh, manuscripts as well. And we have a list of accepted journals and we have a list for, for like uh, blacklist for non-accepted journals. Okay. And uh, the minimum is to be this uh, journal or this, of course, journal will be accepted, but at least the conference, uh, it has to be Scopus uh, approved. And before defending uh, the cities for a master or a PhD, uh, they have to send all of this uh, documentation uh, to the main, uh, main, uh, main library of the faculty or the university, sorry, not the faculty, university. Uh, to be approved that this journal is one of the journals that are accepted in our list. And as I mentioned, we have a blacklist uh, journals. If it's going to submit in it, it will not be accepted. So one publication for a master, two publications for a PhD. And this rules is only applied two years ago. It's in place from a two years ago. Thank you. That's very interesting. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, maybe uh, we can ask um, uh, Mansoura University about the uh, procedure. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Well, okay. So uh, I think there is no other question, right? Okay. So now we will have uh, our presentation from uh, Dr. Osama uh, from uh, Mansoura University. 
You can see my screen right now, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Osama Abdirahim, an assistant professor at Mechanical Power Engineering, Mansoura University. Today, I'm going to give a quick presentation about how Faculty of Engineering dealing with the postgraduate studies during COVID-19. I'm going to present three main topics, postgraduate lectures and exams and seminars and defenses, and finally, the experimental work in labs. So first, I will start with the postgraduate lectures and exams. For lectures, lectures were given as online meetings due to the small numbers of graduate students compared to the undergraduates. Sometimes only one student is enrolled in, in a course, so we don't need a platform for them, such as with what we did for the undergraduate students. Also, instructors followed up with the students through online assignments. For exams, it's going to be held on campus starting from August 8th, and the time of exams reduced from three hours to two hours. And of course, all the precautions issued by Mansoura University, which can be found in this link, will be followed. This link was mentioned before uh, on one of our presentations by Asma. And then I will, I will present how seminars and defenses were done in the uh, in Faculty of Engineering especially. Seminars, for seminars, students with one or two supervisors attend at the head of the department office by themselves and perform an online meeting with other department mem members who are attend online, of course. And all these seminars are recorded and after the seminar is ended, uh, the recording uh, session sent to the student and his supervisor. S uh, since June, uh, in mechanical department, we have three seminars have been held since June. And these pictures, these photos from this one of the, uh, the two seminars. For the defense, a student and supervisors and internal examiners can attend or attend at a pre-reserved conference room at the faculty, while external examiner can attend the defense personally or online. In Egypt, it's different than outside. So in Egypt, defense is an open discussion. So family and friends and faculty member can attend. This is before COVID-19. But after COVID-19, the number of attendance reduced to 10 people only. And now I will talk about the uh, experimental work in labs during COVID-19. As a matter of fact, postgraduate number in faculty of engineering, and if we talk especially in mechanical power engineering department is a small com compared to like MIT. So we don't have a problem of the gathering between many students because actually we have like at most two or three students in the lab, uh, if they are too much people working in the lab. However, during COVID-19, all labs were closed from mid of March until the end of June. Um, some, some students who have small setups are allowed to take their apparatus or devices back home and of course with some measuring devices. And others unfortunately have to wait until the reopening of the labs. And this photo for one of our teaching assistants in our in mechanical department while he's uh, doing his experimental setup back uh, home. Before the reopening of the lab, a lab risk assessment was performed, and this assessment can be concluded into six points. First, a calculation of the maximum people that allowed into the workspace is carried out, and visit, visits to the lab is uh, rearranged via shared calendar, and if a slot has already been booked by more than 10 people, the visit should be rescheduled in another slot. And also, visitors shouldn't stay too long in the same place, and they have to avoid gathering in groups and maximum occupancy sign should be displayed on the doorway of the workspace. And of course, we have a two meter uh, social distancing between all of them. So starting from July, undergraduate uh, senior students were allowed to continue their experimental work regarding their project graduation, uh, regarding their graduation projects in labs. And only one group can attend at once at this time. And as we can see in this picture, this is wind turbine project under the supervision of Dr. Yahya Fouda, and this project was funded by Europe. Also, we are allowed to continue our research work in the lab and these photos from the Nanotechnology Center at Mansoura University. 
Moreover, during every summer, around 240 students from the first year have a mandatory training that is divided into lectures, which is online, and training part, which should be done in the department labs. So as mentioned before, a calculation for the maximum number of students were performed, and they were divided into 30 groups with a maximum eight students per group. And a schedule has been established so that uh, no more than one group uh, is allowed to attend in the same uh, lab at once, and only two groups can be trained per day, one in the morning, like 10 a.m., and the other one afternoon, 1 a.m. And there are four labs are working in parallel. And here's some photos for students attending summer training, uh, which started actually yesterday uh, and will continue until the end of August. And, and th these photos for three of our labs, the energy lab, fluid mechanics lab, and the heat and air conditioning lab. And this is a quick, like, quick presentation about what we did in, and what we are doing in Mansoura University about COVID-19 for labs and graduate students. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Dr. Osama. Um, any questions? No questions? I'll ask one. Okay. Yes, yes sure. go ahead. Okay, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nabil? No, Dr. Dan, go ahead. go ahead. Okay, Dr. Dan, go ahead. You, you mentioned the idea of a bubble. Uh, is that something you've implemented that is an official list of people that you will interact with and outside Sorry. of that bubble you'll avoid? Sorry, I can't hear. You, you mentioned the idea of a bubble, a sort of a, a group of people that you'd be more free to interact with. Is, yeah. is that something you did implement and how is it going? Yeah, we did already. We started yesterday like a group of eight students at most. And they have to be social, like distance between all of them, like two meters. And it's then now is working okay. Of course, we don't have that. We can, we can, we cannot do like test every day or so. But it's going good. They have to do both all masks and everything, and sanitize themselves, their hands, and clean their hands. And it's good. Then now is is good. It's working good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Nabil. It was not a question. In fact, it's a clarification. Um, uh, I'm not sure that you are familiar with the concept of seminar. Uh, it's not a defense. It's a pre-defense. And it is obligatory for all uh, PhD and uh, headmaster thesis. Uh, it is seen by many as the real defense because the student uh, presents his work uh, to the whole department. Usually, uh, there is a large number of persons who attend and uh, when we went online uh, the rule was there must be at least 50% of the department present and uh, uh, everybody can ask questions although there, there is no external referees but you have almost all the department that is refereeing the work and if it is uh, recorded it's because all questions and remarks uh, expressed during this uh, seminar uh, become, let's say, the responsibility of the thesis advisor and his student to respond to, either to accept or not to accept, but in this case they should say why. So uh, uh, this is, uh, as I said before, seen by many as the real defense. Uh, once, once this passes, uh, the remaining part, which is the uh, let's say the formal defense is really a formality. I mean, uh, of course, the external examiner can have more questions, but usually uh, the student feels that uh, this is okay. Uh, the other uh, requirement, uh, uh, we have the same requirement about the number of publications, international publications that is required from journals that are listed in uh, Scopus. That's only the, uh, and, and I'm glad that I've seen Photos from the Nano Center. Thank you, Sam. Thank okay, thanks, Dr. Nabil. But I have a question for you. Okay, or yes, maybe for me. Sam can <laughs> me. Okay, yeah. the the seminar for the candidate, the master or PhD candidate, uh, is it done at the end before his defense, or in the middle of his period, or at the beginning of her, his study period? 
Well, do you want to say, to speak or summarize if, if you wish? If you want to, I, I can do it. It's by the okay. end of. We, we have two okay. seminars actually, one before the start. Exactly, we have two. Of, the, yes. of his research, and this seminar or the I, the topic of his research should be approved by the department. And after this seminar, the student work and do his work. And after he finished everything, he come and do another seminar, which is prior for before his defense. Before the defense. Yes, before so the, the seminar, defense. which are main. Okay, yes. so it would be the same as in North America. We used to have a, an acceptance exam. Okay, and then we have uh, yes. a qualification exam. Okay, and after that, we will have we have to work in our studies and provide a seminar, as you mentioned, to show all of your work. And if it's not uh, questioned by anybody, you can apply for a defense. For the defense, yeah. yeah okay. Good. Okay. So in, in our case at Ain Shams, it's a little bit different. We have a pre-qualified, pre-qualification exam. So all students, they have a written uh, exam uh, for all directions inside uh, a certain discipline, okay, and uh, the department will uh, provide this uh, multiple choice question on a one full day from nine to four, and the student has to pass 70% in each uh, discipline or in total, okay, so this is one item. If, he's, uh, if he passed this exam, uh, he can apply for a master or a PhD based on the study he's going to apply for. If he's going to apply for a master, this is all. This is uh, about all what he's going to do. And uh, he will choose a certain topic. And after a couple of months, he will uh, provide a seminar just to show the work he's going to start in. Okay, and we don't have a, another seminar before the end. This is for masters. For a PhD, the student will enter the pre-qualification exam. And after that, he will do a presentation in front of a committee of five. If he passes both of them, he will be allowed to register for a PhD. And after one uh, year or six months, he will provide another presentation indicating that this is the work he is going to do. And at the end, before the end, uh, before the defense, he will have another seminar. So it will be the same as you mentioned here. Okay, any question then? So I think it's, it's a clear. It's a little bit different than in North America, but uh, I think it's a little bit easier. Yes, of course. Okay, so any other questions to Dr. Usama? I have a question. So you allowed the undergraduate students to enter the campus, to continue yeah. their um, uh, projects, right? Yeah, actually, we allowed before, before because we have also uh, final exams for them, for okay. seniors. We 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 finish exams and actually today was the last day of graduation project. Okay. But we did it all online. We don't have any attendance on campus. But for the training, it it's for the first year only. Okay, because it's uh, different at Ain Shams because we received. Uh, um, like rules from the university, not from the faculty, from the university, and then the faculty applied it, uh, is that we are not allowing any students to enter the faculty, undergrad or grad, till now, okay? Uh, unless if he has a permission from his supervisor for a grad student, he can enter, but it will be, as you mentioned, uh, pre, uh, pre uh, uh, yes, uh, pre-booked uh, uh, date for this student to enter the faculty and we finally started the, on 18th of uh, July uh, we started the final uh, examination for the graduate students and they can't enter the faculty unless they have an email uh, with the code that they are going to uh, enter the exam in a certain, no, certain room certain uh, uh, gate, certain uh, chair number. So if you go and you have your exam and you don't have this permission to enter the faculty, nobody is allowed to, al to let you enter. Even the course instructor, he will not be allowed to ask the security to let you enter in into the 
and to the faculty. So it's very, very strict in our case. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we hopefully will have our graduation projects defended on 28th, uh, 23rd of August. August so yeah. we still have like we're one. We're done with it today. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we still have one month to go. But we ask the students if they have a certain equipment in the faculty and they want to work on in their graduation projects, they can write a request and they can come and take the equipment to continue working on this equipment outside the faculty. And we ask them not to work or we can't ask them not to work on their practical device outside the faculty as groups. This is another issue as well. So we can ask them to work on the device and if somebody wants to work on the same device or to continue a certain part, he has to go and pick up this device and to work on his uh, premises. So we are not, we were not able to ask students to gather even outside the faculty to continue their work. And this is why it's uh, the importance of simulation came into consideration because they can do the simulation aside and then they ask one of the students to implement it or they can have a Zoom meeting and they share the device through the Zoom and one can implement this uh, process or this change in the device itself. Okay, so that's all about uh, our case in, in ancient. So it's a little bit strict, but hopefully because we might have larger number of COVID-19 yeah, positive think. cases in Cairo. So maybe this, this is the situation. Maybe, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So this is good for us. So any other question for uh, Dr. Osama? No, Dr. Walid, I have a question for you. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you will start, start his examination at uh, August 23 for the uh, final year students. No, we already started on the uh, 18th. Uh -huh. of started one, already. Uh -huh. uh, the, uh -huh. the written exam, yeah. and it will continue for almost one and a half month. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. And then we will have the final project defense on twenty third of uh, August, but it will be online as well. Nobody is allowed uh -huh. to ask students to come to defend. Yes, this may result in uh, late graduation of uh, your students yeah. in Anshams University. Yeah. And yes, unfortunately, problem. but these are the rules that uh, govern us uh, from uh, coming from the faculty, from the university, actually. Uh -huh. We have already received the letters of the Ministry of Defense uh, from now to, <laughs> to accelerate the process of graduation. Uh, yes, we have the same issue, but I think we delayed all of our students and they will go in, uh, in January. They are not allowed to join the army in August because they are oh, yes. not graduate yet. Because after everything is finished, it will take almost one and a half months to two months uh, just to get their uh, pre-certification that they are graduates. Okay, for uh, uh, Dr. Walid, uh, will you uh, examine the students uh, on site or online for the uh, graduation project? Online. Online. Yes, we so, are moving yes. everything to be online. Okay, we have already a, a very good experience uh, in the examination online and they have already faced the problems of connection communication with the students. Uh, 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 coming too late to join the meeting and so on. And uh, we have already today finished the, the online exams for the senior uh, students. Okay, I think uh, this Zoom meeting will end by six. So we have only 10 hours. So I think I'll give you a phone call to get your experience. Okay, uh, during the, how did you manage all of these difficulties? Okay, and uh, actually um, what happened is when we asked it for online defense, it gave us an, an opportunity to ask uh, uh, professors from outside our faculty to join us for as an external examiner for the projects, which will be good. We can ask Dr. Ahmed uh, to be one of the external uh, examiner for our students. With pleasure. <laughs> it will be online, don't worry. 
Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. I give you a call to uh, get some information from you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, if we don't uh, then then if we don't have any other uh, questions sure. here, if you want to hear uh, Mansoura's um, experience, <laughs> it's okay for me. There is a hand raised. Inji? Uh, yes, hi. Uh, my okay. question is actually addressed to um, all my colleagues um, at NIT, Ayn Shams University, Mansoura. Speaking of health and uh, safety guidelines in order to uh, minimize risks, is there something like, a, you know, like... Uh, uh, Dr. Inji, I think your uh, speaker is muted. I'm unable to unmute her, I tried. I think she did it by indicate that she pressed the mute. Yeah. Yeah, do you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. yes. Can, you, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. okay. So again, uh, speaking of safety and health guidelines in order to minimize risks, is there yes. something like an auditing uh, survey in order to make sure uh, we have like hand wash things with adequate supplies like soap and drying tissues, adequate number of alcohol-based hand rub dispensers, you know, uh, proper PPE uh, like equipment available just to make sure uh, we follow procedure and in order to be safe? Um, let me, let me uh, answer you from uh, in chance, Faculty yes. of Engineering that I experience and then we can hear uh, Mansoura and uh, Dan as well from M MIT. <laughs> so for NCHAMS, we have a check uh, box, <laughs> okay, check line um, activities. Okay, so we have this uh, certain number of uh, extinction. We have this uh, certain number of um, uh, boxes, which includes first aid uh, equipment, uh, and it has to be filled as soon as they are uh, empty, okay? And as soon as we started with this issue, we discovered that some of these uh, material uh, disappeared. And for, unfortunately, we closed these boxes with the keys and we gave the keys to uh, the guards or the people responsible for each floor. Okay, and we uh, carried out a good idea that we um, had a hotline, it's a, a phone number, it's a mobile phone number. We put it in each floor in the faculty. If there is an, any emergency, you can contact this number and it will be directed, uh, directed the personnel to, uh, who is phoning to a certain person responsible for these activities. If uh, he didn't answer, it will contact the ambulance uh, as well. So I can share with you some of these uh, tables, okay, um, just uh, for your information. This is from uh, our experience at uh, Faculty of Engineering at Encha. Maybe we can uh, get the experience from uh, Mansoura and then we can ask Dan what would be the situation over there. Yeah. Uh, Mansoura, Dr. Nabil, uh, Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Osama. If we can answer this. What we, we also have the same uh, inspection list and more, moreover that we have like for sanitizer and soap, we have like if someone who is responsible on filling it every day in the morning and he's, I don't know if they are doing afternoon or not, but in the morning it's, it's full. And they make sure that it's full. And if someone like found it empty, he can ask this man or this responsible and he can fill it again, refill it again, yeah. So we have the old, almost the same inspection list. Yeah. Okay, now, of course at the uh, range. At the uh, Faculty of Engineering at HMS, we don't have these uh, sanitizers, and we have some sanitizers in the main offices, like the, for the employees. Uh, but for the students, as because we don't have students allowed to enter the premises of the faculty, we don't have these uh, on campus. So maybe then you can uh, add. So the question had to do with sort of 
audit and regulation then, then, in the United then. States. Uh, you know, the USA stands for United States of America, and we have 50 different states that are part of this. And it turns out that we probably have 50 different responses to how to manage under COVID. Uh, a few things were federalized, like uh, manufacturing of personal protective equipment and certain travel restrictions, but almost everything else was left up to states. So those states which had an early surge of outbreaks, uh, mostly coastal states, including New York and Massachusetts and California, you know, we, we faced uh, rising numbers early and we had relatively tougher regulation on matters about social distancing and mask wearing, uh, which things were forced to close and which one were allowed to open. And then the interior of the country in the south, you know, their, their surge of cases came later and they were quite late to regulate. So I think the answer is on our side, uh, there, there, there was a lot of variety in the way we audited and regulated the response in the U.S. So not, not uh, a model in most, for the most part. Yes. Okay, thanks Dan. Uh, Dr. Thank Ruchi, you. What, what is your case? Um, what is the case at uh, Faculty of Arts? Yeah, Faculty of Arts, Ain Shams University. Well, honestly speaking, I haven't seen much measures taken uh, in terms of uh, you know staff. Maybe you'll have uh, like dispensers, like uh, sanitizers, like uh, uh, masks available. Maybe at the dean's office, uh, the vice president, president. But I haven't noticed much around, so that's why I'm asking. It is of extreme importance as far as I'm concerned, so. Yes, uh, I think this is because we also, you also, um, as, as us at the Ayn Shams, we are not allowing the students to enter the campus. They're being allowed very soon because we've already allowed them uh, for fourth year yes. exams and post-grad exams, yeah. Okay, at least at our case, we don't allow even professors to come into the faculty unless they have masks. So this is the only issue we have it. Like all workers, everybody inside the campus for the, of the Faculty of Engineering, they have to wear masks. According to, to regulations, they should, but yeah. apparently not anymore. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. So, my yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, so I think we came uh, at the end of our um, presentations today and I think I give the floor to Dan to conclude. Okay, thank you very much. So I want to conclude rather uh, quickly because we are running low on time. I'll just say first of all I'm grateful that the partner universities had this suggestion for having this series. Uh, not sure I would have thought of it myself but I think it was a very constructive idea um, if I could give a, a general overall structure, we had about two thirds of the session that were dedicated to understanding how an individual faculty member or staff member might respond, you know, how you would adapt your classes, how you would adapt your examinations. And then about a third of the sessions were dedicated to reviewing and discussing the more broad institutional response. You know, for example, today's session on how you could go about opening labs or the, uh, the sessions by Chris Prather on the topic of uh, how we would adjust the grading system or the methods for um, accepting homeworks. Uh, so I hope that that was appropriate and matched our needs, given the, the folks who, who showed up to participate. Uh, it probably was about two-thirds individual faculty and staff trying to work their way through the disruption, and maybe about a third uh, administrators who were trying to set policy questions. So I hope that that was useful to you in terms of the mix. I also felt there was a real highlight, you know, the, the outside session we ran on uh, the College Board and how they dealt with very large-scale assessment, uh, how they managed to 
provide a credible examination uh, even to millions of people by making it quite varied, you know, no two exams were the same, uh, by having vigilance, you know, making sure that any sites where people were likely to be sharing inappropriately would be, you know, discovered. Uh, and quite frankly, by keeping it very short, you know, that's something that they found necessary, you know, more and shorter assessments. And I would say that that is something that's continuing at MIT. We, we had a presentation this morning. We have an, a daily call of spreading information about COVID and our academic continuity in light of COVID. And the Dean of Digital Learning gave a presentation in which he, you know, he let us know that there, there were technologies that they could make available for giving final exams online in which we, we have the student take photographs of the room that they're in so we know everything that's around them. And then we have monitoring. Uh, we, we look at their face and we can monitor their, their screen and their keyboard throughout the exam. So we have a way that we can give a, a, a multiple choice and short answer final exam and proctor remotely. But he also told us that he would prefer that we not use it. That he considers that kind of assessment to be too intrusive, not really in the spirit of MIT. And he wants us to have more uh, authentic kind of examinations and assessments given more frequently so that we take some of the pressure off, at least under COVID, under a global pandemic, we should lower the stress levels by collecting the assessment more gradually over time. And I think that's been a big part of uh, the themes that I've heard in this series of workshops. We're doing everything we can to keep the students safe and to accommodate you know, the very uh, significant personal and professional disruption that everyone is experiencing. Uh, because I've done this so quickly, this summary, um, I, I'm going to emphasize that there will be a written summary also. I'm going to distribute a document in which I describe in more detail all the different people who have contributed and some of the highlights of what they contributed. So uh, I will just remind you that that's available. And I will just finally, uh, the last thing that I want to say is again, thank you for everyone who has participated all of the contributors from both sides of the Atlantic. We really enjoyed the sessions and um, I think that the high quality of this workshop and the outcomes are due to the hard work and open-mindedness of everyone who participated. So thank you for that. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dan. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dan, very much. Thank you. Okay, so I think we're out of time and uh, have a good evening, everyone. Thanks to you, you too. Have a good day. <laughs>